Welcome back to the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, Chris Brown, and I am pleased and honored to have our guest on to the show today. And a little bit of a preamble to introducing our guest. She and I have known each other for some time now. Well, I first really got to know her back in 2010 when I first ran for municipal council in my hometown of Newcastle, Ontario, and she was the sitting school board trustee for Kawartha Pine Ridge District School Board. Uh, since then, we have, well, we've tried to stay in contact with each other, but uh, we just had a pre-interview before the interview, and it feels like we have picked up where we left off. Um, she is currently a school board trustee for the Kawartha Pine Ridge District School Board. And as of 2018, which I thought it was a little bit like earlier than that, but 2018, she is the president of the Ontario Public School Boards Association. Please welcome my friend, Kathy Abram. Kathy, Thanks, welcome to Chris. the show. It's so great to see you again. Uh, it is so great to see you as well. Um, Kathy, I'm going to start the line of questioning off the exact same way I've started every single one of my interviews off with elected officials, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Uh, you know, I think that the role that I play as a politician is a little bit uh, different than other levels of government because my sense of duty to serve uh, is completely wound up in kids and education. And, you know, I've been doing this job, I've been had this role as trustee since 2003. Uh, but before that, I was a volunteer in my kids' school, you know, uh, the classic story, my my kids uh, were in school and I joined the school council and did all of that stuff. And, and so for me, it wasn't so much about um, the, being a politician. It was about helping kids. And so that's always what this job is about me. It's, a, it's wrapped up in kids. So, so yeah, it is public service. Absolutely. Uh, and, and I can go on ad nauseum about the importance of the role we play and why it matters to, to everyone. Which but we will. Certainly it's about kids. <laughs> What's that? We certainly will be going on length about that issue. But I want to start with that 20, 2003 election when you first were elected. What was the issue? What was the moment that you decided to your thought to yourself, OK, this is the election that I need to get involved in because I believe that this issue needs to be addressed. And I believe I'm the only one who could address it. Well, to be quite honest with you, I had not even ever thought of running for trustee. Really? I was, uh, you know, in Ontario, we have school councils. So uh, some places you might know them as PTAs, but in Ontario, we have school councils in uh, my board in particular, we have regional school councils. So every region of the board has one uh, large council where all the chairs of the committees get together. And I was chairing, I had three kids in three schools and I was chairing all of the school councils just because I like that. And uh, I was also chairing the regional school council. And you may remember that our trustee at the time was Bob Wilshire and Bob had been our trustee and, and, and Bob and I only lived like maybe four or five blocks from each other. Right. So I've known him for some time and he was great. He was a great trustee and, and I, a lot of respect for him. Unfortunately, Bob became ill with cancer and I remember uh, getting the, I remember getting a phone call and I don't even remember who it was, but I remember getting a phone call at one point and somebody said, Bob wants you to come and see him at the hospital. Well, you know, I knew Bob, but I didn't know Bob that well, <laughs> but I went. And if you remember Bob, he, if he really liked you, he never called you by your first name. I don't know. It was a thing with him. So I remember getting to the hospital and, uh, and Abraham shut the door and he started to tell me why I needed to run for trustee and why I was the person that he was picking to fill his spot. And honest to goodness, I, until that moment, had never really thought about it. I was, I was, um, you know, I was uh, doing my thing. I was being a mom. I was, but I loved what I was doing. And, and it really, truly wasn't until that moment that I had even thought about running for trustee. Now, uh, the other thing that happened in that year is unfortunately Bob passed away in March. And the board had to appoint somebody to, to be the trustee to fill in until till October, until the election. And uh, I put my name in. <clears throat> and, uh, and, you know, I thought I was incredibly qualified to be the appointee. And they appointed somebody from Peterborough. And I was like, hang on a minute. Yeah, yeah, I, they appointed somebody from Peterborough. And I remember thinking at the time, 
yeah, no, this really matters. It really, really matters who represents Clarington. It really matters that somebody who uh, is sitting at that table knows our communities and knows our kids, knows what's happening. And, and I think that almost uh, as soon, remember back in those days, you could start uh, filing for election in January of the year of the election. I think the day I found out I didn't get the appointment was the day I put my name in because I thought, yeah, I totally can do this. And I totally can do this better than that person. And, and that's, that's how I became a trustee. But, you know, seriously, had never thought about it until Bob, I, I remember coming home from the hospital and my husband said to me, like, what was that all about? And I said, well, I think I just got blessed by the Pope. <laughs> like, it was just like, I was like, so taken aback. But yeah, and that's how I got, that's how I got in, that's how I got here. But I had an interest. It's not like I came from nowhere. Well, yeah. which, which we'll talk about in two seconds, but I just want to clarify something here for a second, because in, in Alberta, where I'm currently located, we have school boards that span very large areas. So for the Kawartha Pine Ridge District School Board, which has been around for some time, it is the, you were first elected as the school board trustee for Kawartha Pine Ridge District School Board, correct? Yeah. It's been there that long. Um, where the Pine Ridge District School Board takes in Peterborough, which people may know if they're listening to this, Clarington, and what other areas? Because if I'm not mistaken, it goes all the way through Northumberland, almost out to Brighton, does it not? Yes, we, we, Kawartha Pine Ridge takes in uh, 14 municipalities, towns, and cities. Uh, we go from, uh, if you're looking on a map, uh, we go from the border of Oshawa and Curtis all the way out to Trenton, to just the, uh, the border of Trenton. Okay. And as far north as Apsley. And so we're 7,700 square kilometers. That is a very large, <laughs> large area. And for anyone who is still a little bit confused, take Toronto, head east. Head, yeah, yeah. Head, head east. Once you hit Oshawa, that's the border of where you're going to be. Well, the border of Clarington and Oshawa is where you're going. So that's the start of it. And that is where Kathy is uh, located. She's in Clarington, which is uh, my old hometown. Newcastle is my old hometown. Um, I want to stay on this, uh, that 2003 election because you have had the honor to represent the school board for some time now, and you are uh, someone who I've known to be passionate about school board issues. In your time of, I want to say, almost 20 years now, has there been changes that you've been happy about and have there been changes that you've been not so happy about with the school board system? Um. Absolutely, absolutely. There's there's changes that I'm very happy about. I am I'm very pleased to see our progression as far as um, um, acceptance of. Uh, I, I mean, you know, we didn't used to be as a system, uh, as an entire system, as accepting of differences. We, we, there's a huge impact, in, um, uh, interest, and and respect for equity, diversity, and inclusion now that was a whole lot more difficult back in 2003. I remember um, very early on having an uh, having a really difficult issue, I, and I think maybe you had moved by the time this one happened, Chris, about the young man um, wanting a, a gender neutral bathroom at Clark High School. That might have been around 2005, maybe somewhere around there. I think I it was know. just after, after while, I. Time all blends. I think it was just yeah. after I left because I left I when you were elected in 2013 in October I was that graduating class so I was graduating right. in June of 2004 and if I'm not mistaken because I remember covering that story in uh, uh, Belleville for a newspaper and I believe it was either 2006 or 2007 it was a few years right afterwards yeah so so that was a huge that was a huge deal and and working so hard to have people understand why we need to to uh, to respect and honor and and give people space to be who they are uh, was a whole lot different than it is now. Like now, it's like oh okay yeah okay whatever you know. But it, it's so I'm very proud of changes like that. I'm very proud of of uh, 
of all of the work that we've done and what happens in our schools around that. I love what we're doing now around Indigenous education. I mean, uh, it, like, as you may know, at Kawartha Pine Ridge, we have, for, we have three First Nations within our board boundaries, uh, Alderville, uh, Curve Lake, and Hiawatha. We work very, very closely with our, our Indigenous partners in education. And uh, I'm, I'm very proud of the, the, how the evolution of that and, and the work we've done with that. And I'm also very proud of where we were to where we are now around student voice. You know, we used to, Core of the Pine Ridge, I will say, it was one of the very first boards that had a student trustee. When we didn't have to, we thought it was the right thing to do. Now every board in the province has to have one. But, you know, really, we're talking about educating kids. We should probably talk to the kids about what they want and need. And, and so I'm very proud of where that's come. Uh, some of the things that I haven't been as thrilled with, you know, and it's not local, it's not like our local governance things that I'm having, I have some problems with. It's the, the relationship between school boards and the provincial government has changed. Uh, you know, um, uh, Ontario for many years, 1998, uh, and you remember, we lovingly referred to it as the Mike Harris years. Uh, we common, have sense revolution, common sense revolution. Yeah, yeah, common here. sense revolution. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we have we don't tax. I mean, I think actually Manitoba was the last province province that was uh, had taxation rights, and I think that uh, I, I, I mean, in fact, I know that I think that they've lost they've, they've lost that ability. Uh, we don't do that, so we don't raise any. We can't we can't make that kind of local decision making where, you know, for instance, in, in Clarington where I am right now, we're growing like crazy, like we we're so many new houses. Well, we don't have the the, the ability to say, yeah, we got to build a new school. We're going to put a 0.5% increase on taxes. It, it all comes out of one coffer. So that, that, that becomes difficult. It becomes, and, and being so closely tied to the central government, uh, things like capital expenses become an issue for us where we're going to the ministry to, uh, you know, sometimes I say beg and sometimes I say ask. It depends on my mood of the day uh, to get money to build new schools when we so desperately need them. And when we, and, and, and the same thing, you know, right now they put a moratorium on even talking about closing schools. That's not a favorite topic of anybody's, but sometimes it's important to think about that. And how does it work? We can't do it. We are so tightly wound uh, to the whims of the provincial government. Uh, that doesn't thrill me, but you know, for, for the most part, I do feel like, as a school board and as a school system, you know, we've come a long way, baby. You certainly have. I, I, I see the uh, pride flag pin on your lapel pin right there. So. I always wear this, you know, that's not a, I, I, you know, it depends on what side of the jacket it goes on. But if I'm doing stuff in my official capacity for OPSPA, I wear OPSPA here in the pride flag here. I always wear it because I think, uh, especially when you're in schools as a trustee or as a teacher or, or anybody, uh, kids need to know that it's that you're a safe person for them. And, and it makes a difference to me. Well, thank you so much for doing that. I want to turn back to that 2003 election because you said you were angry that a person from Peterborough was appointed to represent Clarington. On, in October of 2003, you, you, the check mark goes beside your name. You're officially the new school board electee for Kawartha Pioneer District School Board for Clarington. What was that experience like? Do you still remember that moment? Oh, well, there's <laughs> nothing like the first time you run for office and you go in to vote and you see your name out. And, it, and still, it still thrills me. I got to <laughs> tell you the truth. It's still sort of like, oh, that's my name on the ballot. And, but that first time was like, you know, I tell people that running for election, no matter what position you're in, is like going into a, the biggest high school you can ever think of in grade nine and standing in front of a full school assembly and saying, do you like me? And, and it's, it's, it's really hard. It's hard. But I remember that night and being, you know, so happy that I won. But I also remember waking up in the middle of the night and thinking, oh, my gosh, <laughs> I won. <laughs> and, and. Can I, I, I was, I was very nervous. I was very nervous about it, but you know, uh, it turned out that, yeah, this was the place for me. And I, it, it all made sense to me. And I, don't get me wrong. Running for trustee is, is not uh, for the faint of heart. And it's also, there is a steep learning curve. And as much as I felt like I'd had a lot of experience 
uh, with the school board and I'd been on policy writing committees and I'd done all this, I, I didn't know half of it. It, it, is a, it is a steep learning curve, but I do remember thinking, waking up in the night and having that moment of panic and thinking, what have I done? You know, but yeah, it's, it is, it's quite the experience. And I still get very nervous. Like we're, we're what, 10, 11 days out from our provincial election now. And I'm, <sighs> yeah, I'll be glad Mun when it's over. Municipal election, right? Municipal, municipal yeah. elections. Yeah. yeah. Um, you talked about the moment you got to get elected, you're excited. And then you wake up that night going, Oh crap. There's a weight and responsibility that is put on elected officials, particularly at the local level. And this is where this show has come from is talking about that responsibility, talking about that weight of responsibility, because the decisions that you are going to make, the decisions that you make on a day-to-day -day basis or a week-to-week -week basis at the school board affect not only your friends, your family, but your community members and community members across the Kawartha Pine Ridge District School Board. How much of that weight and responsibility do you still wear every time you go into a meeting? Absolutely that. You, if you're not aware of that responsibility, then you maybe shouldn't be doing this job. You know, I, as you mentioned, I'm president of our provincial association. So uh, I, do, I do a lot of speaking engagements where I talk about the role of trustee and why it matters. And, and this is the weight we carry. This is, what, this is the story I tell about our job, is that our sole responsibility is to ensure that students who are leaving our schools are prepared for the future. Because if we are not educating those students so that they're prepared to take that next step, whether it's post-secondary, in, in some form, college, university, apprenticeship, whatever, or go to work. Uh, if we're not preparing them for that, they become underemployed, they become underhoused, and, and then they become uh, uh, sadly a statistic around food insecurity, sometimes health issues. And all of that impacts every single person who lives in our community, our province and our country, because it's a drain on the economy. And so for those people who, who say to me, you know, you know well, oh, I like the trustee, what does it matter? That's why it matters. Because every single person, no matter who you are, uh, you rely on somebody being well-educated. And, and it starts with us. I wear that responsibility. I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'm very aware of it. And I try to get that across to people, especially right now in the, in, in the midst of an election about, about the importance of knowing who your trustee is and who is setting the direction for education in your community for years to come. We don't have room to mess up and go back and do it again. You can't say to some kid, you know, we didn't do grade two right when you were there. And I know you're 17 now, but let's go back and redo grade two. We, we, we got to get it right the first time. And so that's, I, I wear that responsibility and I'm, I'm very aware of it. And I try to get that across to people about that's why our role matters. But how do you balance that? Because with the, the KPR being such a large board, you are there to represent Clarington. But at the end of the day, you can't look at just the issues that are in Clarington when you're making board decisions, because you have to look at the board as a one whole entity with bringing the ideas and the concerns of the parents and the schools to the school board from Clarington. So for you, how do you balance the needs of your community against the needs of the board? Because you're there not to just represent Clarington, you're there to represent the entire KPR, even though you're only elected in that certain area? Well, in fact, in Ontario, under the Education Act, the legislation says, once you're elected, you, your first priority is to the whole board. It's not while well, balancing those other issues. So you're right. Sometimes something comes towards the, in front of the board and we're making a decision on something. And you're going to ask me for an example, and I can't think of one off the top of my head. No, I'm not. Gonna, I'm not going to ask you for an example. I'm going to ask you this because I agree, and I think I think there's a lot of in the legislation in a lot of provinces where you have to look at it as a whole. 
But when you run, you never think of that. You're thinking about your local area because you're in the midst of an election right now. And I guarantee you, you've heard candidates and people talk about, we need a new school in this area of Clarington, or we need new teachers in this area. We need more EAs in this part of the community. But at the end of the day, when you're looking at it as from a board's perspective, when you're elected, that idea of, okay, I can only think about my community and only my community has to go out the window, does it not? Absolutely. Absolutely. It does. Listen, you know, uh, there is a difference the first time you run and then the fifth or sixth time you run too about about those conversations, because, you know, uh, so somebody comes up to me and says, you know, I live in this new subdivision and we really need a new school. I can say absolutely we need a new school and working with my colleagues on the board, we will work towards getting a new school. It, you, you do you become a it's not group think don't get me wrong because we certainly don't agree on everything. But the, the idea, what, what the role is, is when I sit at that board table and the administration comes to us and says, you know, here's what we want you to make a decision on. I look at it through two lenses. How does it affect my community? How does it affect the whole board? And, and you have to be able to put those two thoughts together and figure out what's the best thing to do. And certainly sometimes, sometimes it might not be the best, like the absolute best thing, but kids everywhere in KPR deserve the same opportunity my kids do in, in Clarington. So you, you have to find a way to uh, mesh all that information together and then make the best decision you can. Because it is true, you know, we are a little bit different. I, the municipal politics, uh, as in like my mayor and council members, and I always use the example of you know, uh, you know, you know, Clarington, and we're partially a, a rural area. And so I remember at one time somebody came up to me and said, you know, uh, I want you to come out and look at the, the school and do this, 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 and this. And, and I said, ah, you know, I can't really do that. That's not my role, but I'm going to get the people who can. Well, Councillor so-and-so came out and looked at where the fence was and agreed that it was in the wrong spot. And I went, okay, well, council members might be able to do that, but I can't do that. Like, that's not, it's a little bit different role. You have to, you just have to take all of the information you get and make the do the best you can with it. I want to go back to your little example that you said about the community member from a new neighborhood saying we need a new school. How much of communication and uh, responsibility around informing the actual truth to people is important to the KPR district school board and yourself? Because you, you want to sit down and you want to tell them, yes, we do need it. But like you said, the board needs to decide. And right now it may not be a top priority for the board to put a new school here. We're looking at Brighton right now. And in our master plan, 10 years from now, that school may be on our books, but right now it's just not a feasible option. How much does truth and responsibility come into play when you're talking to constituents about their concerns? Well, Chris, we've known each other a long time. <laughs> <laughs> You know that I I am fairly blunt. Like I like listen. When I first ran in two thousand three, I'll give you the perfect example. When I first ran in two thousand three, I re, I know you'll remember Little Newtonville Public School. Uh, my Newtonville mom worked there. School. My mom yeah, worked no, there. Did she? That's right. That's right. She worked there. Right. So I think I think it had like forty six kids in it. So the community in Newtonville was, I know, right? So the community in Newtonville was all like, we got to keep our school. We got to keep our school. And I was at an all candidates event here in the village, Newcastle, which is close by. And a person came up to me at the candidates meeting and said, if I vote for you, are you going to vote to keep that school open? And I said, no, no, I'm not. I said, I don't think that's good for kids. And I will vote for what's good for kids every time. So in your example, what I would say to the person is like, you know, I, you're right. Like I can see, I can see, and we understand that we're going to need a new school. Here's how it works. We're going to make a list. We're going to ask the ministry of education for money for your school, money for that school. And then we're going to make a business case for all of it and see where we get the money. I, I'm pretty blunt. I will tell people I'm pretty like, you know, I'll just tell people like, this is the way it works. And, and like, we've got it. You know, we've got a situation right now, and I know you understand it because you are in this area. Uh, Clark High School, when you were there, I think it probably had about 650 kids, right? That would be about right. I think, I think my, my graduating class was, I think, 52 kids, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, and that's but listen, all. the entire school has 150 kids in it right now. What? Yeah, yeah. It's it, we because 
uh, we went through this sort of demographic change. Well, we went through decline. Everybody went through decline. And then when we started to, to get go back up, because that school had gotten so small, we're not able to put the same programs in it. So everybody was going to where the programs were. So yeah, we've got a problem. I have been campaigning hard with this, the Ministry of Education to get uh, uh, the school. And then, and then people didn't want to go on the highway. We are the only school in Ontario that is situated on, they don't call it a 400 series highway, but it's pretty much a 400 series highway. And no 115. Yeah, yeah. Nobody wants to go. The, the new people in the town don't want to go there. I don't blame them. It's on a highway, you know. So, uh, you know, I will have new people to the village come up and say to me, well, we need this and we need that. And I go, absolutely, we do. And let me tell you how, the, how that works and how you can help me get it. I'm pretty blunt. I'm pretty upfront. I always will tell you the truth. Uh, I will I will always tell you the truth of the way things are. And sometimes it's not pretty. And sometimes it's not very helpful to me. But I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna not tell people the truth. And I know that I. You know, I. I sometimes there's. Yeah. Sometimes people don't like that. But you know, I'm not. It's so it's so much easier to remember what you've said to people if every time you're telling them the truth. True that. Um, I want to ask one last segment. Uh, one last question in this segment. Then we're going to turn to the your other role as president, and that's balancing work and life. Um, yeah. As a local minis- a local uh, elected official at a school board, you will go to your grocery stores and people will know who you are. You go fill up gas, they know who you are. You go to the local LCBO, they know who you are. How do you balance the needs of trying to always be engaged with your, your constituents with the needs of having just a personal life and going out to dinner with your husband at the snug and shameless plug here they're not endorsing they they have no sponsorship here but i just i know the snug is the hot spot in newcastle or the massey house so how do you the newcastle house the newcastle house that's right i forgot about the newcastle house i was going to name all the pizza pizza uh, the pizza joints but there's too many but you don't have time (laughs) so how do you balance that work that 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 engagement level of public life with personal life of just wanting to go out and just enjoy yourself from time to time it is it is um it can be a challenge it can be a challenge i'll tell you uh going back to 2003 when i first got elected you know um my husband at one time played in a billiard league right he played pool every every wednesday night he played pool at all the hole in the wall I, I, uh, that's a local reference that you know uh it, it, it was a, a local pub right it had pool tables and it's a bar and, uh, and great chicken wings. They had really good chicken wings. And every Wednesday night, he played in a pool league. And he'd go down there and, and play pool. And my, our kids were, uh, our oldest would have been like 12 or 13 at the time. And, and the youngest would have been eight. And so uh, I would every once in a while on a Wednesday night, we'd take two cars and go down there. And I would have a beer with my husband in a bar um, over the age of you know 19. And I'd have a drink and I'd come home. And because we had our kids old enough to watch the kids. Shortly after I got elected the first time, before I'd even been sworn in as trustee, I wasn't even I wasn't even sworn in yet. A friend of mine says, "I'm in the hairdresser, the hairdressers. I'm in the hairdresser," and uh, she starts going on about, you know, that new school board trustee. I I heard that she was in a bar drinking with a man, and I'm like, "Hold on a minute, <laughs> I was in a bar drinking with a man. I'm old enough to do that, and uh, he was my husband, or he still is my husband." And, <laughs> And, uh, you know, and like the comment was like, what kind of an example is that to set for kids? And I'm like, well, there were no kids in the bar, but I think uh, that was a lesson. That was a a very uh, cheap lesson for me about uh, recognizing exactly what you were talking about, about balancing. I am, I am very careful about where we go and, and uh, like we go out for dinner in town or something, uh, but I'm pretty careful about things and if there's something really really hot happening in the in the village and i just need to buy a bag of milk i i'll go to, i might go to the next town over to get it just because i know a bag of milk at the food land should not take me an hour i you know i could i could walk there and back 10 times you know it, but it happens you have to find a way um i don't mean this to be i don't want to sound mean about people but you do have to find a way to protect yourself a little bit because I, I deserve to have a life uh, that's, that's not under that much of a microscope. I, I, a microscope. And I believe that about all elected officials. Like there's, 
you know, yes, I'm, I'm a 24 seven trustee, but on, you know, Christmas Eve at, at 9 PM and I've had more than one glass of wine, that should be okay for me in my own home. But do people understand, because I can imagine going to the next town over all the time to go get milk if there's a hot topic issue, because I lived in Clarence, I lived in Newcastle. I, I know there's lots of people like that and no disrespect to anyone. And I think it's a great, it's great, uh, show of support that people are engaged democratically when they have issues they want to talk about but are you willing to are you able to go and say i, I would love to chat with you here's my business card call me tomorrow and we'd be happy I, I've to done that. yeah yeah listen can't talk to you right now i always i always will have i always have my cards on me and I'll, and I'll say this or sometimes i'll just say to them you know what i don't think this is a great place to talk about this because everybody can hear us. So here's my card. Call me tomorrow. I mean, I'd love to talk to you. I can do that. And I have done that. And, and people, for the most part, you're right. I mean, I, I, they're engaged. At least they want to talk to you. I mean, you know, that's, that's a good thing. Um, and I have done that. People are pretty good for the most part about that every once in a while, you know, I, you know, we've been through in, in our board, some pretty um, big school closures and I can remember one, not in Clarington, but in Peterborough in particular, which was pretty, pretty ugly. And uh, I remember a, a very big man backing me up against the wall and putting his finger in my nose. And I was, I was actually a little afraid, you know, wagging his hand at me, telling me nonsense, actually. But, uh, you know, you, uh, you have to learn how to diffuse those situations when the anger comes out. For the most part, though, people just, they, they just care. And they just want to talk to you, but some, but there is a balance. You're right. I mean, I, I kind of have this rule about, I don't answer the phone after about 8 30 PM at night. I, I, I need time to decompress from things. Everybody does. I, you know, I'm kind of careful about a few things like that, about, you know, listen, I, I, you know, you've known me a long time, you know, I, I have a daughter who, who uh, struggles with mental health issues. And I've learned a lot from her struggles about taking care of my own mental health. And one of the things you have to do is give yourself time to do those things to take care of yourself. So, you know, you do what you can, I do what you can, but I, I'm always open to talk to people. I, I know I said that was going to be the last question in that segment, but I have another one to follow up with because we are seeing the rise of online hate of uh, political partisanship through online uh, forms. We are seeing federal politicians attacked. We are seeing provincial politicians attacked. We are seeing uh, out here in Alberta, some municipal politicians attacked, whether it be through online discussion boards, Facebook, Twitter. And that's why I think Twitter and Facebook is the worst thing ever. But here we are. That's how we connect with people in 2022. Have you been on the receiving end and have you, oh, oh, how, oh, absolutely. How, how do you deal with that? Because you talked about mental health and that's where this question came from is how do you deal with that through your mental health? Do you just ignore it? Do you just say, okay, whatever, if you want to yell into the void of whatever cyberspace that you're using, go ahead. I'm not listening. Or do you actually take the time to read it just to understand what people are actually saying? Um. You know, it, it, listen, it really depends on on what's being said. I'll be honest, like sometimes it's absolutely like it's nonsense. Sometimes it's so racist and homophobic and transphobic and every ism or whatever you want to like that. I won't even I can't even bother with it. I don't engage with those people. Uh, you, if you if you start out by telling me that, uh, you know, I'm doing uh well i mean i remember one year running i remember one year this is many many years ago somebody telling me i was turning all grade six boys gay uh, i don't really need to talk to you because like that's ridiculous uh, and uh i don't i just don't engage i don't engage i uh, listen it is this has been a tough couple of years uh, the covid and then for for whatever reason uh, and you're right i mean the 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 hate and the vitriol and the, it just i don't know why people think it's okay to say things to you online that I would certainly hope they would never say to you face to face. Like some of the stuff has been really awful. In fact, uh, not this past summer, but summer before, uh, not through my local role, but because of my provincial role, I actually had to get the police involved in, a, in an online threat. You know, for the most part, 
yeah, I just kind of go, okay, whatever, mute that conversation. And I, I don't, it doesn't really affect me, but that one did. Like he was very clear about, I hope you have security at your home. I, and it was like, oh, I, like th that one did. And I, I remember calling, uh, I actually, I called a cousin of mine who's an OPP officer. And I said, what do you think I should do about this? He said, call, call Durham Region. And I, I called the police uh, uh, station. I told them what had happened and, and, and they said, no, you're, you're right to make your report. Now, I never heard from the guy again and nothing happened, but I was scared enough that I called the police. That's not right. Like that is never right. It does not matter who you are. It doesn't matter. Like, I don't, you know, listen, we know each other and we're, we're friends because we're political beings mm -hmm. and we talk a lot about what's going on politically. And I know lots of people like that and I don't have to agree with everybody. But she, what gives you the right to threaten somebody's security? What gives them the right that makes me feel like I need to call the police because I'm concerned that my family's in my house and oh, this guy seems to think he knows where I live. And like, you know, and that's not the, that's actually not the first time I had, a, I had another incident here in Newcastle with an upset parent who uh, we actually, we had, we did get Durham Region to go visit him because he did say to me, I know where you live and I, I'm coming to see you. And I was like, what? That's wrong. And how and do you protect your mental health around that? Is you have to, for the most part, I, I shut everything off. Like, I mean, at nine o'clock at night, I, I'm off everything. And I, you know, watching my sad blue jays during that season, uh, or, you know, like I, I try to get, I try to shut it off. Um, it, it is hard. It's hard. You have to work at it. I go to the gym. I tell people I, I clearly don't go because I'm trying to be thin, but I go to the gym because of my brain. Like I, it, it helps me with my mental health. You, you just find ways to take care of yourself. Um, I want to turn to the big topic and that's your role as a president as, of the Ontario. I want to make sure because every time I said it in the, my pre-interview before you even got on, I always got it wrong but the president of the Ontario Public School Board Association. And I want to start with this question. And before I preface this question, before I state this question, I'm going to preface it with this. This is a conversation between Kathy and myself. This is an opinion of her. This is, an, this is a conversation. This is not a motion at the School Board Association's council. This is not a direction. This is just an opinion. We seem to forget that sometimes people can have opinions. And yes, they do then get brought forward in a political sense. But this is just a, a political opinion right here, right now. Kathy, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing school boards in 2022 heading into this new term? Oh, uh, if I were to ask my colleagues and if I were to just kind of look around at the things that are happening right now with my provincial colleagues and um, just things that I see that are happening right now, I'm going to say protecting public education as a as public education. Um, you know, you and I spoke briefly earlier about what we're seeing happening here in Ontario. We're seeing it happening uh, from I'm hearing from colleagues across the country of people trying to uh, get on school boards to change. Uh, kind of the direction we're heading about uh, on the issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion. I gotta tell you, uh, that's my biggest fear around this election. And, and um, you know, every, every, local, every local trustee, every local school board is gonna have their own little local, lone local issues. But I would say provincially, that's what I am most concerned about. The change in um, what we're seeing, this change uh, around acceptance and trying and people who do not believe in it and all of an EDI as we call it, as we short form it because we short form everything in education um, who do not believe in that trying to take over school boards that is not good for kids that is not good for our province that's not good for our country it's not good for this world when we become racist homophobic transphobic people and trying to keep that element out of school boards is a, is a concern of mine right now so how do we fight back? And I say, I don't want to say, actually, I'm going to rephrase that question because I hate the word fight in the, in the sense when you talk to school boards. How do we, how do we change that? Because 
yes, you're right. And we're seeing it here in Alberta. And I've talked to school board trustees from across this country, and they're saying the exact same thing. Um, elections are elections. Elections matter. People get out and vote and they, the best person, the person who had the most plus one vote wins. And we are in a situation right now where we're seeing a more right wing, uh, more conservative bent when it comes to people looking at school boards. How do we change that? How do we get people to understand that equity, diversity and inclusion actually is a priority and needs to be a priority because I, and I, we said this during the interview before the pre-interview, and I'm going to say it again. I remember growing up, growing up at Clark high school, I was a gay kid. And I can tell you the hate, the vitriol, the attacks that I got on a regular basis. And I, from people that say that they're friends now who have reached out, out after my cancer diagnosis and said, sorry to hear about your cancer diagnosis. And I'm saying, you made my life a living hell in high school. And now you're doing this. So how do we change this? Because we have come so far. And you're right, it looks like we might be going backwards instead of forwards. Well, first of all, I, I want to say this. Um, I try not to refer to those folks and this whole thing as necessarily conservative. I don't True. believe they're truly conservatives. I think that there's there's something else afoot, and I don't even know what you want to call it. alt right. It would be for sure, but I I mean I have I have friends from all political stripes, and I know lots of people who would call themselves conservatives who do not uh, adhere to those ugly thoughts. So, and we're very clear about that. Um, you know, it's almost like a two steps forward, one step back thing, right? Uh, listen, I think that uh, we've talked about this. In fact, just, just recently, uh, in the last couple of weeks, we had our board of directors meeting for, for OPSPA. Uh, we never say again, it's an acronym. We never say <laughs> Ontario Public School Boards Association, it's too many words. And uh, we talked about this issue. And I said, it's, it would be so easy to get into a schoolyard fight and like you know you're wrong and you're this and you're that and that's not that's not how we do this this is this is an education piece and so what i've been trying to do uh is say let me explain to you what critical race theory really is because if one more person tells me we got to stop teaching it in kindergarten i mean if i had a dollar i you know might be able to get a coffee at tim hortons but you know um with inflation theory, you might be able to get a small a small yeah listen <laughs> well yeah you know because but they but they're hearing these fear-mongering things right like people are going oh they're gonna do this and hate and hate is definitely is, is usually based on fear so if you think about it like that and you so you've got some person saying oh you're teaching these kids about this i go well first of all you know here's what that really is here's why we're not teaching it but here's why we think these things matter. And I'm, you, you really have to just recognize that it comes from a place of fear and then educate them. And that's incumbent upon all of us. It's not just up to me and it's not up to the teachers in schools. It's up to, you know, you're sitting at, you're sitting at Tim Hortons having a coffee with your friend and your friend says something that's not, that you're shocked about likely, and that's not true or accurate. You have to have the confidence to say, no, that's not right. And it, I, I liken it to the bully and the bystander, right? How, long, how often do you always hear about, yeah, you can't, if you see bullying happen, you have to say something. If you see racism happening, you have to say something. If you see, you know, uh, somebody being transphobic or homophobic, you have to say something. You don't have to be confrontational. You don't have to be ugly about it. You can just be educational about it. And that's, that's how I think we have to do this. Now, having said that, <laughs> um, it's, it is hard. I think the kids are going to save us on this one too. You know, uh, kids don't, for the most part, come to school already deciding who it is they don't like. Like they come to school and, and every kid in their classroom is there. When you're four, every kid in your classroom is your friend. And uh, somewhere along the lines, they learn that they're being taught something different. And it's, they're eventually going to uh, be the ones that tell us it's wrong. I, it's, I liken it sort of to the, the smoking thing, right? It was kids that convinced their parents that this is wrong. And I think that's what's gonna save us. And that's our job as, uh, as school board trustees, as school boards, to make sure those, those 
that's why this election matters uh, to make sure that those lessons are in school so that when you know we don't we're not telling anybody uh they have to be or should be or can't be anything we're just telling people in kindergarten that you know uh little johnny susie whomever that sits beside you yeah they got two dads they got two moms that's okay who cares who cares and and that, that's all we're telling people be kind and, and that's how it starts, those, those little lessons where it's in the curriculum, where they, they see that um, uh, the, the person that you're learning about that's doing this big science experiment has brown skin and it's normal. And, and that's how it starts. It, it is a hard one. It's a really hard one. But I, I know uh, right wins in the end and we're right about this one. So, so we'll, we'll get there. What's your relationship like with the Minister of Education in your role as president of OPSBA? OPSBA. <laughs> OPSBA. <laughs> well, it is. A, listen, we work very closely with the ministry. I, um, you know, I, we, we talk about having different levels of relationship. You know, that's the politician, the politician level. So I talk to him quite regularly. I'll be honest and tell you over COVID, we, we were, we spoke quite regularly about how we were managing things, what's happening uh, in schools and, and offering advice and those things. Uh, we still do. I mean, if there's a, if there's a, it's, it's quiet right now because there's a respect for the fact that we're in the middle of an election, right? For my job. And, uh, but if there's an issue that's come up, I, I have a cell phone number. I'll call him and I have or, or send them a quick, te quick text and say, I need to talk to you about this. So I have a relationship with them. We have to have a relationship with them. They, they are, uh, they're the money people and, and, and they set curriculum and they set legislation around our job. So we need a good relationship. And it's our organization is nonpartisan. So, you know, before uh, the Ford government got in and it was the PCs, it was the liberals and our organization had the same relationship with them. And we work very closely with our Ministry of Education. I also work closely with the critics. And don't, you know, don't think that just because, you know, the, the, the Liberals or NDP or Greens aren't in power, we're in contact with them as much as. I, I want to turn to my last question on this subject before we wrap up, because we're almost at the 50 minute mark and I don't want to take up more of your time here, Kathy. And that is as the president of OPSA, OPSA, OPSBA, OPSBA. <laughs> which is the weirdest acronym I've ever heard, but know, here we are, we I live know. in 2022. Could be worse. Um, you are responsible to look at, look, to lead the organization and it's many, many school boards. How do you balance? We talked about the balance of local and individual on the core of the Pine Ridge District School Board. How do you do it on a provincial level? How do you balance the needs and wants of all the different school boards? Because I, I have been watching the news and I see what school boards are going through in Ontario and the one in Halton is going to be different than the one in Ottawa and the one in Thunder Bay is going to be different in Kenora than down in Clarington. So while you are a rural urban uh, trustee, because Clarington is kind of a rural urban divide, how do you balance the moving forward as one, as a school board association? So there are things we all agree on. We have we have priorities that we all agree on, right? Uh, so uh, mental health of students, uh, capital funding. Like there, we have the five or six indigenous education. Like, like we have priorities. Underneath those priorities, it absolutely is different wherever you are in the board. So if if something's coming up that we're commenting on or advocating for provincially, I will actually say it is very important that we have local flexibility about this because what's happening in Clarington or Kingston or Ignace or Thunder Bay or Kenora or anywhere in this province is not exactly the same. We're not cookie cutter. It, it, I take a lot, I spend a lot of time trying to understand each area's issues because clearly, uh, you know, you live in northern, northwestern, northeastern Ontario, it's a whole lot different than downtown Toronto. Does it make it worse, better? No, it just makes it different. And so we need to understand that. Um, you're right. It's a, you know, the, the, we represent the, uh, the 70, uh, we represent the 31 English public school boards, 10 school board authorities. There are 72 school boards all together in Ontario. We have, we have 31 of them and 10 authorities. We represent 73% of all the K to 12 eligible school kids, school kids in Ontario. They're in our schools. So we have a big responsibility and it's my responsibility to make sure that everybody's viewpoint 
or everybody's issues are sort of uh, being looked at. We push hard about local flexibility, about being able to uh, have room in any government direction to, uh, to do it the way it suits my area. That's one of our big priorities is to make sure they understand that. How do, it is incumbent upon me to keep in touch with uh, my colleagues to make sure I understand their issues. And that's how you do it. And there are times, there are certainly going to be times when, you know, how an issue impacts one area over the other is going to be negative and positive for each area. It's up to me to say to the ministry, up to my the staff at my office to say to the ministry, yeah, you need to know this and you need to find a way to fix it. And that's, it's an interesting position. It, it's a, it's a real juggling act sometimes. Do you enjoy it? It really is. I love it. Listen, I'm in my, I'm in my fifth term, my fifth year as president of OPSPA. I, when I get done, uh, the, I, we do two year terms. So my term is over uh, uh, next year. Uh, I, I will be the longest serving uh, in not next year, 2024. Boy, I'm pushing things. I'll be the longest serving president of OPSPA they've ever had. I love it. I love the, uh, I just, the interactions with uh, people across the province, the understanding what's going on, that feeling of uh, having such an impact on such a big level, because, you know, kind of what I say, I always feel really, I, I, this, uh, it's embarrassing. I feel bad when I say this, like what I say matters. And, and having that kind of an impact is like pretty heady stuff. And, and knowing that, um, you know, knowing that when stuff's hitting the fan, the minister of education calls me like that's, that's pretty big stuff. I, I just really enjoy the work. I love governance. I'm a big nerd that way. I, I, I love the fact that everybody that I'm working with, we all have the same goal in mind about kids and education. And it's, it's a good bunch it's to be around. And I, I really enjoy the work. I enjoy it a lot. Aww. Well, Kathy, I want to thank you so much for sitting down for the last 15 minutes and doing this. It's been an honor and pleasure to talk about uh, your role as trustee, your role in the Ontario Public School Board Association, because I'm not saying the acronym, because like every time I say it, I say it wrong. Um, <laughs> and I want to say thank you for opening my eyes, because I, I did... Uh, it, I put out a post on LinkedIn and I talked about local governments and you really opened my eyes when you said school boards are local as well. And it didn't hit me until you say that said that I went, Holy crap. She's right. They are local, local, local governments as well. While they are boards, they are part of the local structure as well. So thank you so much for reminding me that school boards do matter and school boards are local as well. So thank you, Chris, for inviting me here. And I want to just say that um, one of the reasons why I did that was because uh, we're, we in Ontario and Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, BC, we have locally elected school board trustees. That is not the same everywhere in our country anymore. And we need to protect that. We need to protect that local piece of locally elected school board trustees. And we, we, I, as part of my job at OPSPA, I sit on the Canadian School Boards Association and we work really hard at trying to raise awareness about why it's important to have a local voice and a local choice. So in Quebec, they no longer have French language school boards. They only have English language because that's protected under the constitution. In New Brunswick, in Nova Scotia, in Newfoundland, Labrador, they have school boards, but they're appointed, so it's not locally elected. Now, PEI uh, got rid of their school boards, but they're bringing them back. But this is about your local voice and about you having the opportunity to say what matters to you where you live. And, and it's, it's really important. You know, school boards in Ontario are the, the oldest democratically elected po politicians in the province. We existed before mayors did. And it's, it's really important. So that's why I reached out and I knew it was you so that I knew that I could be a little bit kind of like, uh, Chris, what about us? <laughs> poke, poke, <laughs> yeah. poke. <laughs> yeah, poke you a little bit. So I do really, really appreciate you having me on. 
And nope. you know, anytime, anytime. Well, I, you, you've started a whole new series that I'm putting together in 2023, where we're going to be doing a month long series like we did with municipal government officials. We're going to be doing a full month of un, uh, elected school board trustees from coast to coast to coast and talk about the issues that are facing the school boards in our country, because we are finding that in Canada, people care about federal politics they care about provincial politics but they don't often worry about what's happening municipally and that school board and we need to change that so this is a first step in a journey that we're going to be taking in 2023 so thank you so much for taking that step with me kathy oh you're very welcome you're very welcome and thank you again for inviting me so with that i want to remind everyone put down your phone put down your phone put down twitter put down facebook put down TikTok, whatever they call it these days, put down Instagram and go have a conversation with somebody. Get out from behind your social media and have a conversation. It helps our democracy, it helps our society, and it helps us at, at the end of the day be a better people. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking. <laughs>